Have a seat there if you would do that. Good morning, good morning. Hope you're all doing well. And we are going to get back now into our study through the Psalms. Would you open your Bibles to Psalm 34, verse 1? I'm still thinking about last weekend and how God amazingly moved. There were so many who gave their lives to Christ, so many who rededicated their lives. God was amazing. Can we give him praise? It was just absolutely amazing. Amazing, amazing. But today we're in the Psalms, and as you know, we're just going through the whole Bible. And when we finish Revelation, we'll do that again. This is our fourth time through the whole Word of God. The message this morning is taste and see that the Lord is good. It comes right, of course, out of this Psalm. So let's pray. Lord, we open our heart now to receive from you. We invite you to meet us here Pour out your spirit of life through your word. Show us the way of life. Show us the victory that we have in the name of our Lord and Savior. So we give you honor as we open our heart to receive from you today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Psalm 34, written by David, is uh, an acrostic psalm. There's a few of those. And what it means is there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so every verse, notice there's 22 verses. Every verse begins with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, right? So the first verse starts with Aleph, right? Beit, Gimel, Dalet, etc. All the way down through the Hebrew alphabet. And the reason is so that it's easy to remember. Great memorization uh, technique. And of course, the idea is that every word, every verse of this amazing psalm is so important. You want to memorize it. You want to write it on the soul of your heart because it is filled with so many practical living applications for us. Now, the introduction of the psalm tells us what was happening in David's life when he wrote it. David was in great peril. He got himself in a very, very difficult and dangerous predicament. Afterward, he escaped uh, to the cave of Adullam, and there he sat down and wrote this psalm in honor of God, because God had rescued and saved him yet again. And so this is one of the most famous, and certainly one of the most quoted of the psalms. And you're going to see how many of these verses are very familiar to those who, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, take hold of great truths in the word of God. And this is so important for us. David was in great predicament and peril. And so he gives us in the psalm principles that guide us through predicament and peril and difficulty. Life is filled with difficult predicaments and we would do very well to learn from David. You see, there are principles for navigating through troubles, even in the most difficult predicaments of life that are found in this psalm. See, when you're navigating through difficulty, perils and predicaments, you come to what I call decision points, right? Uh, turns in the road, uh, paths that cross, decision points. What do you do? Do you go this way? Do you do that? What, what do you do? See, there, there's, no, there's no GPS turn-by-turn -turn navigation for troubles. Wouldn't that be marvelous if, if there was? Don't go straight. There's a big jam up ahead. You're going to get into great troubles. No, take this exit. Go this way. Wouldn't it be great if there was a GPS to navigate through troubles? Just my luck, it would be a GPS with an attitude. <laughs> Do you remember back in the day? Back in the day when GPS was first a thing, remember they used to get GPS devices? and then you would put them on your dash or whatever. And back in, back in the day, I discovered that you can download different voices. And I thought it, <laughs> I thought it would be fun to download Yosemite Sam. <laughs> Only problem was Yosemite Sam had an attitude. And if I missed the turn, Yosemite Sam would say to me, I said, turn left, you varmint. And okay. Back to our regular story. <laughs> There's no such thing as GPS to navigate you through troubles. No, but there 
our principles from God's word. God's word is a lamp to your feet. It is a light for your path. And we are going to see those principles that you need to know and take hold of before the peril, before the predicament of life. All right, now, the back story here is found in 1 Samuel, and it's this. King Saul was, uh, had become jealous and angry over David. Now, what happened was, of course, after David killed uh, Goliath the Philistine, he became famous in Israel. Uh, Saul attached him to his army, made him a captain, and he was amazing. Just a hero on the battlefield, one victory after the other. And the women started to sing uh, songs that Saul did not like at all. And uh, the women were saying, oh, David, or excuse me, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And Saul was infuriated. What more can he have with the kingdom? Well, that was the problem. See, the prophet Samuel had already told Saul that God had found a man after his own heart to replace him as king. Well, it became quite obvious to Saul that David was that man. Therefore, Saul sought to destroy David and thwart the will of God that was against him. And so, in fact, uh, twice David was in the, the, the dining hall there with the king and the king's men. And uh, at, at one point, Actually, twice, Saul became so hot with rage, he took hold of a javelin, a spear, and hurled it at David, trying to pin him to the wall. David, you know, uh, ducked. Now, that's a sure sign right there that Saul's not happy. And so David realized the peril and that he needed to uh, flee. So at first... He uh, went to, he fled to the prophet Samuel, but Saul sent men in pursuit there. So then David went to Ahimelech, the priest at Nob. And interestingly, uh, when David went to Ahimelech, the priest, he did not reveal to the priest the true reason that he was on the move. Not wanting to expose the priest to danger. See, he did not want to put the priest in the predicament of having to choose sides, of having to side with David, which would make him become treasonously disloyal to King Saul. See, David was trying to save his life by keeping the truth from him. The truth was that David was on the run from that murderous, jealous, angry king. Instead, David said to the priest that, Saul had sent him on a secret mission and that no one must know that he was there. But David did ask for help from the priest and that request put the priest in a, in a difficult place. He asked the priest, do you have any weapons? Uh, the, the, I, I left, you know, the king's matter was urgent and I brought no weapons. Uh, do you have any weapons? And so uh, the priest said, uh, no. We only, the only weapon we have is the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you slain there in the Valley of Elah. But uh, if you wish it, take it. And so David said, ah, the sword of Goliath, there is none like it. And he took that. But then he said, do you have any food? You have five loaves of bread, anything. And so the, the priest said, uh, we have no common uh, ordinary bread, we have only the consecrated bread of the presence. See, in other words, uh, every Sabbath day, the priests would bring uh, uh, 12 loaves of flat bread into the presence of the Lord, and then that would be uh, before the all week without those loaves, and then he would take the old loaves, and that would be for the priests, and the priests only were allowed to eat of that consecrated bread. So he said, I have no ordinary bread. I only have the consecrated bread. However, if you and your men, there's a few men with David, if you and your men have kept yourselves consecrated, you may have it. Right? Now, here's where some interesting principles arise out of the story. David withheld truth from the priest so as not to put the priest in the predicament of betraying the king, which would be treasonous, the priest offered David consecrated bread, which was lawful only for priests. 
Here is where the principles unfold. What do you do when no matter which path you choose, it is a difficult choice? What do you do when principles collide? Here is the, the principle. Choose the highest good. When principles collide, when no matter what path you choose, it is fraught with difficulty. What do you do? There's the principle. Choose that which is highest good. Now, if decision points are hinge points that change the course, then we need wisdom. How do you choose the course? The wisdom that, of God's principles that help us to know the way to choose. When principles collide, here it is. You choose the highest good. Here, here's an example from our own life. Uh, not nearly as apparel as this, but nevertheless, uh, the story is this. Uh, we, were, we were pregnant. My wife was pregnant with our third, and uh, about 10 days before the due date, she woke up with this pain. So excruciatingly painful was this that she said, it feels like her pelvic bone was broken. And, and she could not move, excruciating and pain. I called the hospital. They said, this is an emergency. You need to get her here either by ambulance or by car. She needs to get to the hospital right now. The baby could be in peril. You must get her to here right now. I said to my wife, it's an emergency. Either we take the uh, ambulance or I drive you. We got to go now. She says, drive, let's go. And of course, uh, part of the problem now is that she feels like uh, and her pelvic bone is broken. She cannot move, right? So I had to pick her up. I know. I, I picked her up and brought her in the car. Now, that part of the story is not important, but I just had to mention that part there. <laughs> anyway, all right. So we get in the car, and we're driving down the road, down TV Highway, and we came upon a red light. Now, the law of the land for law-abiding citizens is that when you come upon a red light, you wait. You cannot go through a red light. That's the law. All liability citizens agree. And that's the law. So I, of course, now the baby is in peril. This is an emergency, but there's a red light. That is the law. So I sat there and waited for three minutes. No, I did not. <laughs> I looked both ways and went right through that red light. And I have to tell you, it felt kind of good. <laughs> and then we came to the next red light. I did the same thing. Looked both ways, went right through it. I came to another red light. Interestingly, there was a car there, and I just felt something. And I, I went and through the red light. Quickly, it turned green. He caught up to me. And then there was another red light. Went through that one. He turned me into the police. He called. Yeah. <laughs> me? But he did. All right, now, the story unfolds Then we get to the hospital. It turns out the baby had a raging blood infection. And the doctor said, yeah, if they had to do an emergency C-section, of course, the baby was quarantined, mom was quarantined. And uh, later the doctor said, yeah, if you had not brought that baby in, if you had not come in when you did, the baby would have died. And I said, well, what was that pain? I mean, a blood infection, that does not explain that degree of pain. He said, I have no idea, but if it wasn't for that pain, then you would not have been here and the baby would have died. He said, you know what? We have, we have a phrase for that in the medical world. We call that providential intervention. I go, that's interesting. We have a name for that in the church too. We call that the hand of God, a miracle. <laughs> Amen. So I get home, the quarantine, the baby, you know, is all, is all better. We get home and there's a letter from the sheriff. You were seen going through red lights, and, you know, this and that section and stuff. And I thought, oh, we better call the sheriff's office. You know, we don't want that. Pastor arrested for red light. No, we had to. I called the you know, sheriff's office and explained what happened. And interestingly, the sheriff's representative said, you did not break the law. When life is in peril, you go through that red light. Now, call us next time. We'll give you an escort. But you don't wait. If that's an emergency, you go through it. That is interesting. Bring God into every equation. 
into every decision of choosing, and he will direct your course into that which is highest good. Do you run through red light? Do you break the law? Or do you save a life? Either way, the choice is that which is the highest good. Jesus, interestingly, spoke of this very principle when the Jewish leaders one day accused Jesus of of doing that which was not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He and the disciples were walking through a grain field. They had picked some grains of, of, uh, of wheat and, uh, you know, rubbed it and, and ate it. And they said, now oh, that is harvesting. You're doing that which is not lawful. And so Jesus said to them, Luke 6, verse 3 to 5, Jesus answered them and said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, how he entered the house of God and how... He took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That path is that path of highest good. Choose the highest good. All right, now, back to Psalm 34. Let's read the psalm, starting in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His Praise shall continually be in my mouth. All right, now David, again, he's in the cave of Adullam, and he looks back now, and God has rescued and delivered and saved David from one peril after the other. And so he says, I will bless the Lord as at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Oh, the humble will hear this, and they will rejoice. And I love verse three. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And come on, let's exalt his name together. And he said, now verses one to three, by the way, is kind of like a blanket that covers the whole psalm. Then he's looking back and says, this is what happened. Verse four, I saw the Lord, he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed, those who look to God. This poor man cried, David says, the afflicted. I was afflicted. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. That's the theme. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Another great principle and will rescue him. And then verse eight, very famous, very, very quoted. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's saying to everyone who reads this, taste for yourself and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord. Now, the word fear in in English, I think is better translated uh, out of the Hebrew, revere. Definitely powerful, poetically beautiful. Oh, revere the Lord, all you his saints. For to those who revere him, there is no want. There is no lack. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, dependent on the matriarch lion. No, but those who seek the Lord will be in want of no good thing. They shall not be in want of any good thing. Great principle. And then he says in verse 11, he's, he becomes our instructor. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the revering of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? Of course, we would all raise our hand there. Who is the man who desires life? Who is the one who loves length of days that he may see good? Then listen. Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking lies, deceit. Depart from evil, do good. This is the revering. You do this out of revering, out of respect. Seek peace, pursue it. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Now, the face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. But the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Here's another verse, very famously quoted. The Lord saves those who are crushed, afflicted of spirit, 
verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them, him out of them all. Another famous verse, write that one down. Verse 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. All right, this is quoted in uh, John 19, referencing the Lord on the cross. Not one of his bones was broken as fulfillment of our verse. Verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked. In other words, they'll come back on their head. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned. They'll be held guilty. But the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. All right, this is our psalm. Beautiful, powerful, great principles, again, for all of us to take hold of. Notice starting in verse one. Bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. See, David is writing this psalm now. After all is said and done, he looks back. God has saved him over and over and over. He's giving God glory for rescuing and saving. But when you notice... First of all, please notice the attitude of David's faith. This is very important. David's attitude of faith. Faith has this attitude of trust. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. This is important because David has gone from peril to predicament to difficulty to trouble. And many people do not know how to navigate through predicament or peril or trouble. And they get angry. They get frustrated. They say things. They get hot. Angry even at God. David is showing us a very important key to navigating through peril and predicament. No, I will Bless the Lord at all times. There's an attitude of faith. His praise will continually be in my mouth. I will not do it. I will not get angry. I will not get frustrated. Now, this is a very important principle, and I'll tell you why. Anger, anger is destructive. When you get angry, frustrated, and do things and say things, it's destructive. But faith, trust, looks and believes it's constructive it builds let me give you another word i I wish i would put this in the in the notes isaiah 26 verses 3 to 4 you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you trust in the lord at all times for the lord is a rock okay now that's a good word That's a great word. You will keep in perfect peace him who trusts in you. This is the key to David's, the attitude of faith in peril and predicament. Anger is destructive. No, watch, wait, trust. He's a rock. Here's an example. Uh, When Israel was rescued and saved out of the oppression and slavery of Egypt, I mean, they had been crying out, you know, in their impression. Uh, and, and God, you know, look at and hear us, you know. In our, uh, they were still going through difficulty. So God, by his miraculous hand, uh, uh, brought them out of that and into the desert and then provided for them there in the desert, again, by God's miraculous hand. But they're in a desert. Like, they got to go through a, the desert, which is hot. And frankly, if you've ever been through a desert, you know it is hot and you get irritated. It's difficult. All right, how do you navigate through? You gotta go, we're not done. Yeah, he saved them out of Egypt. We're not done. We gotta get, we gotta get through this desert. What, what, there's a bearing. There's an attitude of faith. All right, we gotta get through this thing. But what did they do? They started to grumble, complain, you know what? They didn't need to be in the, they didn't need to be in the desert for 40 years. They could have they could have made straight way. But that attitude kept them and so God said those grumblers and those who lacked faith and those who were complainers, no, every one of them will perish in the desert. The next generation, they are the ones that will go into the land, I promised. For example, uh, Numbers chapter 11 verses 4 to 6. He says the rabble among them. Huh, 
Interesting description. Uh, <clears throat> the rabble among them had greedy desires. And they said, oh, we remember the fish we had for, we used to eat free in Egypt. Oh, <laughs> The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions. Oh, don't you remember the good old days when we were in Egypt? Don't you remember the good old days when we were oppressed and slaves? No, there's nothing now here for us at all except this manna. Manna, manna, manna. And it says, Numbers 11, 1, the people became like those who complained of diversity in the hearing of the Lord. They became like those who complain of adversity. What are you doing in adversity? David is giving us the key. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. There is an attitude of faith. This is important. This is a key for us. Then he says, verse 2, may your soul boast in the Lord. Notice verse 2, my soul will boast in the Lord. See, it's interesting that David begins there by saying, my soul boasts. See, in other words, he, within his own heart, within his soul, he's giving God a glory, a boasting of God in his own soul. He just is like between him and God. God, you're amazing. You did it again, Lord. I'm amazed. Bless your name, how you have done this. I boast of God in my own soul. Now, he says, the humble will hear this. Oh, and they'll rejoice. But he starts out by saying, I'll boast in my soul. This is a key, again, to David. You did it, God. It's between him and God. Notice 2 Samuel 22, verse 36. David here in 2 Samuel 22 is looking back over his life. You have given me the shield of your salvation. The shield is what you hold up in front of adversity. Your help makes me great. This is another great key to victorious uh, uh, faith, walking through the life's predicaments and peril. God's help. David walked through every peril. He, he marched right into trouble with that faith believing God is with me. Your help makes me great. You enlarge my steps under me and my feet have not slipped. Psalm 32, you surround me with songs of deliverance. That's beautiful. Now, when David left Ahimelech the priest, remember the story. Do you have any weapons? Only the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So David took the sword and after he left Ahimelech the priest, he went immediately to the area of the Philistines. Now, he went there believing that Saul would not pursue him there. And the area that he went to, the city he went to was that of Gath. Now, if you remember your history, you might remember that Goliath just so happened to be from the city of Gath. So, this was likely not David's finest hour. Here's my point. Now, we can understand why David thought to escape Saul, uh, his wrath by fleeing the country. But to arrive in Gath, the city of Goliath, carrying the sword of Goliath on your side is probably not going to end well. Now, he gets there, and the servants of Achish, who's the king of Gath, they recognize David. Wait a minute. Isn't this David? Isn't this the one that, you know, they sing about? Saul has slain thousands, but David, his ten thousands, is this not him? Now, when David heard those words, he immediately knew there is trouble. He is out of options. What do you do when you're out of options? He has no army with him. Yeah, what do you do? He's out of options. And there, David gets creative. There, in, the, in just in that moment, we believe that God just put in on his, an idea on his heart. He just, David got creative. He feigned madness. He started acting mad, right, crazy. He's scribbling on the doors, letting saliva run down his beard. It was a convincing ruse because the king of Kish wanted him out of his presence. Notice 1 Samuel, you, you know it should say 1 Samuel 21, verses 14 and 15. Then Kish said to his servants, behold, all right, you see this man, 
You see this man behaving like a madman. Why did you bring him to me? Do I like madmen in my kingdom? Is that it? Do I like madmen? That you brought this one to act like a madman in my presence? What, should I bring him into my house? Get him out of here. It worked. David escaped to the cave of Adullam, some 10 miles away. He's looking back. He's blessing the Lord. God, you did it. David was out of options, and God put this on his heart to escape from the grip of danger. I believe that in that predicament, God will put on your heart in that moment what you need. I'll give you an example from my own life. Again, uh, far, far less than what David experienced. But it, the story is this. Uh, we were in Russia doing our, uh, we were adopting our boys. It was a Russian adoption. We were in Moscow the night before our departure. And our plane was going to leave the next day, I think around noonish. And uh, uh, our, our uh, interpreter was going through our paperwork and said, hey, those passports, they just got new passports. They don't have the stamps or the signatures. They're, they're not leaving this country without those stamps and those signatures. They're not going anywhere. The problem is the office that they would get those stamps and signatures was an hour and a half drive through snow and ice one way. And we thought, what do we do? So we decided we would get up in the middle of the night, drive there, be the very first ones when that office opened. We had it all figured out. We'd be the very first ones. The office opens. We get our stamps, our signatures. We then drive quickly to the embassy, get that stamped, and then go to the airport. Right, we all we had it exactly had to be just so, and we have to be the first ones. All right, so we get up, and uh, it's in dark, it's icy, it's cold, and uh, we the driver that they hired was going down the like 80 miles an hour. I'm thinking, oh God, here we are, in your hands. Right, we get there to the office, and I thought, oh no, there was a line in the snow, probably 20 deep. And I thought, oh no, what do we do? We are out of options. If we wait for that whole 20 people to be processed, I know Russian bureaucracy, this will take forever. What do we do? We are out of options. And then I see the officials drive up in their official cars. And then I, instantly, an idea comes to my mind. And... I realized I am wearing an army surplus coat. My, I inherited it from my brother. It meant a lot to me. It was a nice, thick, wool army surplus. When, you know, one of those real long ones. And I realized that's an army surplus coat. That looks official. And I thought, hmm. So I said to the people with me, I had one, one other father, the interpreter, and the oldest boy, and I said, follow me, do not speak, walk the way I walk. So we went over, stood by uh, in the snow as they're getting out of their cars, and when the last official uh, started going past, past me, I got right behind him, so I walked and looked at the authority. <laughs> and I walked right past the whole line, and they opened the door, I walked in, and I stood before the official with a bearing of authority. And I said to him in Russian, Zdravstvo, tovarich. Mnye nujna vash pomoch, pejosta. I need your help, please, sir. He looked at me, said in Russian, what do you need? I turned to the interpreter. <laughs> in other words, my assistant will take it from here. And so he said he needs these stamps and these signatures. It's urgent. He looks at me. He looks at the passports. Stamp, stamp, sign, sign, go. Yes. <laughs> Amen. I believe that God will give in the moment the predicament. If the attitude of faith is, show me, God, what do we do now? Don't. Relent on faith. What do we do now? Then notice back to Psalm 34, verse 8. The word of the Lord is tested and tried. See, notice verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's saying, taste it for yourself. 
See, the relationship with God is far more than a theological understanding to David. No, it is a manner, it is a way of life. It is a spiritual bearing of faith. David's trust was everything to David. David went from peril to predicament to trouble to difficulty. And this was the bearing of that faith, relationship with God. It's everything now. Taste it yourself. Taste. And you'll see it yourself. Because the word of the Lord is tested. Notice Psalm 18, verse 30. The word of the Lord is tried, tested. God has proven himself to me. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Taste it for yourself. See, when you taste and see that the Lord is good, you are partaking in the life of God for yourself. It becomes life within you. See, this verse suggests that when you partake of the Lord, it is good on the soul. It settles well on the soul. This is far deeper than any theological understanding. This is not mental agreement. Taste and see that the glory of God settles well beautifully well on the soul. You must partake on the soul. It's glorious. See, there's a great difference between studying the ingredients in food and eating it. There are many people that are very well studied that are empty and hungry. They have nothing in their soul. They're studied well but they have not tasted of it. You must taste of it. Don't just, when you go to a restaurant, you don't just study the menu. I'm not leaving until I have, I want my soul nourished. You must partake. This is the difference. David is showing us a key here. God wants all of us to take hold of this great principle. No, you must partake of it. Ah, oh, it is good. It settles well on the soul. It is beautiful in the life and in the heart. See, when you partake, you're tasting and you're being transformed. Your soul is being transformed. By it. However, make there, let there be no mistake. The opposite is also true. Notice Job chapter 20. We studied it when we were going through the book of Job. Though evil is sweet in the mouth, and it is, the world is sweet on the mouth. But in the stomach, it's changed to the venom of cobras within. That is a good word right there. Like, you want a principle of life? You want one of those principles that will guide you? Should I go this way? Should I go that way? What should I do? Well, here's a principle. Write this one down. Evil is sweet in the mouth. You might look at something and you say, you know what, that is very sweet to the flesh. But it's poison to the soul. It becomes the venom of cobras within. And interestingly, the one who, who, who delights in the taste of evil will even lose his financial bearing. That's what it says. He swallows riches, but he'll vomit them right back up because God will expel them from his belly. You want a good word? That's a good word. And then he says, notice in contrast to that, notice where he goes next in the psalm. There is no want in those who revere God. That's a great practical life-bearing word. There is no want in those who revere. See, notice 9, verse 9. Oh, revere the Lord, you his saints, for to those who revere him, there is no lack. Now, the Hebrew poetry then is beautifully seen as that David then recites that truth beautifully over and over. Notice verse 10. Young lions lack, suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord 
shall not be in want of any good thing. But notice the key, those who seek, it's an active faith. Those who seek the Lord, taste and see, desire and hunger for that which is gloriously beautiful on the soul, actively seeking for those who revere will seek him. If you respect God and revere him, you will seek. And for those, they will have no lack. He will be your Jehovah Jireh. The eyes of the Lord, verse 15, are toward the righteous. He will be your Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. Then David becomes our instructor. Notice Verse 11, David will be our instructor and life principles will follow. David says, come children, listen to me. I will teach you the revering of God. I will show you now the revering of God, David says. Immediately our ears perk up. David is going to show us something of the revering of God because we know that this is a key to David's understanding. This is a key to David's victorious faith. He's going to show it to us now. Listen, children, I will teach you the revering of God. Who is it that seeks for life? We do. Length of days that he may see good. Then let me show you. Verse 13 and 14. Then keep your tongue from evil. Keep that out of your mouth. Because of your revering God. If you revere God, if you respect God, then keep that out of your mouth. And I'm saying it kind of boldly, but I think that's what David is trying to say. David is trying to say something bold here. You wonder, it's a, it's a key to David's understanding. You want to revere God? Keep that evil out of your mouth. Notice then, keep your lips from speaking lies, deceits. No, depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. See? Your bearing is a pathway of your choosing. Do you desire life that you may see good? Then revere God and show it by the choosing of the path, the pathway of peace. The pathway of life, all the pathways of good or loving kindness and truth. Choose that. You want to revere God? You want to respect God? Choose that path. Because there's another path too. There's a path of worldliness and disrespect and dishonor. It will not do well in your soul. It will not do well in your soul. You will not do well in peril. You will not do well in predicament. Let me give you a key to life's perils and predicaments. Choose the pathway of peace, that which is good. Pursue it. Seek it, long for it. And then notice verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. David says, let me tell you, taste for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You'll see it. I know this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Jesus said a very similar word. Uh, In this world, you will have many troubles, but take courage. She's talking of your faith now, the bearing of your faith. Take courage, man. I've overcome the world. There will be troubles. There will be afflictions. In fact, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many people do not know how to navigate through peril or predicament. This psalm will show you how. There are many afflictions. But the Lord will deliver them, him from them all. David ends the psalm. Similarly to how he began, David has endured one affliction after the other, but he maintains his faith victoriously. I will bless the Lord at all times. The attitude of David's faith, the bearing of David's faith. His praise will continually be in my mouth. That's what's in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Yes, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all, and he'll do it for you. 
the attitude of faith, the bearing of faith. There will be many afflictions, many troubles, David is saying, but he shows us a, a, a key to his understanding. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. I will not quit. I will stand on this rock for I know my God. And I know that he rescues and saves, that he's good. I have tasted and I've seen that is, the Lord is good. The glory is good on the soul. I want that for you, he says. Taste it for yourself. Taste it for yourself. Let's pray. Lord, we stand amazed of who you are. How glorious is the promise. Taste it for yourself, David says. How many would say to the Lord today, I want to taste in full. I want my soul filled, overflowing, because I know it's good. I know that it settles well on the soul. It's beautiful. It settles beautifully on the soul. God, I want that. I want to be filled, to taste it for myself. Church, would you say that to the Lord? Would you just raise your hand as a way of saying that to the Lord? I want to taste it myself. I want to, I want to be filled. I know it settles on the soul beautifully. I want to pursue more. I seek God. I seek you. I want to taste it for myself. I want to see the glory that settles well on the soul. Just raise your hand as a declaration to God. Father, we are so thankful for everyone who stirred, moved of God, that we would be those who are victorious in our faith. Show us the life of victory that is found in the name of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can we give